pretty eyes, pretty thighs, Charlie she a dime. Demon girl, evil eyes, she be telling lies. So today it is my pleasure to interview Dr. Tom Mendiotis, CEO of the New York uh, Genome Center and professor at Columbia University. Dr. Mendiotis, thank you for being part of this episode. In hindsight, of such a successful career, can we start with you taking this back and telling us about your educational background? So uh, I um, I grew up in Denver, Colorado, and uh, was an undergraduate at the University of Colorado uh, at Boulder, uh, where I did undergraduate research that uh, turned into a master's thesis. Uh, I then went from there to Vanderbilt University, where I, uh, it was at that time, a new department of uh, molecular biology. And uh, I, uh, I received my PhD uh, there. I then uh, went on to uh, postdoctoral work, both at Harvard University uh, and in uh, the uh, Medical Research Council Laboratory in Cambridge, England. Uh, and I then became a part of the Harvard faculty uh, because of uh, issues around uh, early days of recombinant DNA research. Uh, I moved to Cold Spring Harbor and then to Caltech, where I was on the faculty for five years. Uh, I was at Harvard, uh, went back to Harvard for 30 years, and uh, moved to Columbia about 10 years ago. There's a lot of moving around, to be honest. Yeah. So how do you get interested in the biology and biochemistry field? Well, I, uh, I majored as an undergraduate in chemistry and biology. And uh, at that time was uh, really uh, the beginning of what we call molecular biology. And uh, as an undergraduate there, uh, I was uh, walking through the bookstore and uh, I saw this new book. It's called Molecular Biology of the Gene, uh, which was uh, authored by uh, James Watson, the discoverer of DNA, uh, the structure of DNA. And uh, I was absolutely fascinated and decided that that's uh, what I wanted to do. And so uh, that's why I went to Vanderbilt. It was a new department of molecular biology. And my mentor, Leonard Lerman, uh, was uh, really uh, you know, a biophysicist, but deeply involved in molecular biology. Yeah, so when you were studying under Dr. Uh, Leonard Lerman, uh, so what do you do there? And how did Dr. Lerman like influence your career? So uh, Dr. Lerman, uh, uh, actually had uh, spent some time at the MRC and uh, played a key role in the early studies of the genetic code. And uh, he, uh, he, at the time that I uh, started working for him, he was a, um, a very interested in uh, very compact structures of DNA. Uh, you know, when DNA is in, uh, in a human cell or in a, a virus particle, it has collapsed many, many times from its uh, original volume. And so the question is, uh, what are the structural uh, constraints that are necessary to package DNA like this? And so he, um, he had a way of inducing this chemically, and I was able to do that and then do something called uh, small angle X-ray scattering. Uh, to show that the that the DNA did not have to take any unusual configuration to be compact like that, and it was a, a an important insight into uh, how DNA folds. Mm -hmm. So you initially did research on cDNA cloning. So my question is, what is uh, cDNA cloning? Well, I think the, the important lead up to that is that. Uh, when I went uh, when I went to Harvard, I um, uh, I worked for uh, Dr. Mark Potashny, and uh, he had a couple of years before isolated uh, a protein uh, that was a repressor of gene expression. Uh, it you know it basically turned off genes, and it was in bacteriophage. And it was a great system because you could do both genetics and molecular biology on. And uh, what I was able to do in that project is to determine precisely 
how the protein binds the DNA, uh, how it's arranged and how it regulates transcription. And uh, that was really the impetus uh, for the cloning work that was uh, done subsequent to that, because I had to use uh, tools that were uh, not previously used uh, in that project. Uh, it was really the first DNA sequence of a regulatory uh, gene. Uh, and it was, it, you, and I did this in Fred Sanger's lab, who was the inventor of the technology that was used to sequence the genome later. And so uh, because I was using all these tools, it was really possible when the opportunity came uh, to think about cloning genes, uh, I was able to do that. Mm -hmm. So how did like cDNA cloning really affect the whole biotechnology field? Well, uh, it had many impacts. Uh, the most specific uh, uh, application was to use it to isolate genes. So the cDNA is just a copy of the messenger RNA. And uh, in order to get the gene, uh, it was necessary to uh, clone uh, the genomic DNA. And in order to identify specific genes, it was necessary to have uh, these, uh, these probes. So they were labeled radioactively and used to isolate genes. But the second application, and really was a major uh, effort, uh, was to uh, use cDNA cloning to produce important proteins in mammalian cells. And that required two things. It required uh, full-length cDNA cloning uh, because you had to have the whole uh, gene. Uh, and, uh, and secondly, a way to get it into mammalian cells. And uh, my collaborator at the time, Richard Axel uh, and uh, Mike Wiggler, had uh, figured out how to do this uh, for viral genes. And so uh, we collaborated to show uh, when we uh, later isolated the globin gene that we could put it into cells, into mammalian cells in culture, and it was expressed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, to see DNA cloning made it possible for the recombinant DNA technology, which you were a big part of. So this term seems kind of fancy. So can you explain what recombinant DNA is? So basically... Uh, the, um, the human genome uh, is 3 billion uh, units or base pairs of DNA. And uh, there are 25,000 genes in the genome. And uh, in order to study a gene in detail or express its protein, it was necessary to isolate the gene. And so what we did was to... Uh, fragment the human genome into pieces that were about 20,000 units long. Uh, and by a lot of uh, very complex uh, enzymatic and biological methods, we're able to then uh, create what's called a library of genomic DNA. So within uh, a test tube, uh, you have the entire human genome on uh, 20,000 uh, different uh, recombinant uh, phage. And so then it was just a matter of using uh, tools uh, and the one we used with cDNA that was critical. You label cDNA and then you fish out uh, the gene that you're interested in. And the first gene that we isolated and it was the first human gene to be isolated was beta globin. And uh, of course, beta globin uh, encodes one of the chains of, uh, of uh, hemoglobin. And uh, because there was uh, a well-characterized disease in globin uh, called beta thalassemia, it was possible then to uh, look at genes from individuals that uh, had that disease, uh, compare it to the normal, and therefore identify DNA sequence changes that uh, are responsible for the disease. And that was, you know, one of the, probably the earliest example of that. And of course, uh, these days, that's the center of research, trying to understand uh, the mutations uh, in DNA that cause virtually all human diseases. What is up? It's Diamond Go Back again. Make sure you check out LibSign, a podcasting distribution platform. If you want to start your own platform or podcast, use my promo code DG. 
to sign up for two months free of LibSign. Sign up on www.libsign.com. Yeah, so you're, um, it's really interesting now you talked about cloning cDNA. So was your goal of cloning cDNA ever uh, derailed in any way? Well, it was derailed because uh, at that time, uh, there was an issue about uh, the uh, potential biohazards of cloning. And, uh, and so during that time, the, uh, this Cambridge City Council, and I was at Harvard at the same time, uh, passed a moratorium on all, uh, on all recombinant DNA research. And that led to a national and international debate on the dangers and so on. And so there was a period in which we had all the tools necessary to do that, but we were unable to uh, carry out the, the cloning uh, uh, because of that restriction. But fortunately, uh, they were uh, guidelines were uh, made, and we were able to then do that, and that was the you know, cloning of the of the globin genes. Yeah. So I you know you were uh, recruited to Caltech by Dr. Robert Sinsheimer. So you know, interesting, Dr. Robert Sinsheimer. He was a prominent opponent of recombinant DNA. So yeah, why did Dr. Sinsheimer decide to recruit a strong recombinant DNA supporter like you? Yeah. Well, that's an interesting question because. Uh, Dr. Sinsheimer, who you uh, probably know, uh, passed away uh, a couple of years ago, was an extraordinary intellect and speaker. And uh, he had a deep interest in science, but also in sort of public policy and uh, ethics. And so somehow he was able to divide his uh, positions between those two roles. So on the one hand, uh, he really saw that uh, cloning was going to be transformational in biological research. But on the other hand, he had this issue about uh, potential dangers. And so uh, he was uh, probably the most uh, highly regarded opponent of uh, recombinant DNA research. It was without the kind of emotion and uh, issues that came up, certainly in Cambridge, uh, and so he was, uh, when word got out that he uh, offered me a faculty position, uh, there was a huge controversy. People were really, the people on that side of the argument were very upset with him. Uh, but he continued. Uh, but uh, I'd say after about f uh, four years, uh, he gave up research. Uh, he left Caltech and became the chancellor of uh, University of California at Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. So, you no. Know, when you guys were together, like, so did you guys have any like arguments about recombinant DNA research? Well, I mean, it was everywhere. Uh, you know, I uh, and what historically what made this uh, interesting is that uh, this was just uh, at the end of the Vietnam War, and in Cambridge was probably one of the most active anti-war movements uh, in the country. Uh, it was really, you know, a sort of a major intellectual issue. The professors were deeply involved in it. And so uh, they basically uh, took sides. So here you have a group of people who are against the war, and then about half of them were supporting recombinant DNA research, and half of them were against it. And it was just, it was a very awkward and difficult uh, period in which uh, you know a lot of uh, sort of longstanding academic and uh, interactions and friendships were uh, were lost. Mm -hmm. So, you know, during your time at Caltech, you know, you mentioned that the Dr. Norman Davison was another great mentor for your lab. So, what advice did Dr. Davison give you to jumpstart your lab? Well, uh, uh, Norman Davidson uh, was extraordinary. Uh, one of the wisest and uh, sort of uh, most uh, interesting people I've known. And uh, I, it happened that when I moved in there, I uh, my laboratory was uh, right next to his. And so we became good friends and we literally talked every day. We had lunch uh, at the Athenaeum at Caltech uh, on a regular basis. And he was uh, really, I think, uh, in, you know, impress my career in many ways from uh, from the perspective of rigorous science to 
uh, to really ethical issues. Uh, it, it, it had a big impact uh, on my career. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people said that the Human Gender Project could be used to discriminate against people. So do you have anything to say regarding this ethical concern? No, I mean, it's like anything, you know, when there are uncertainties of a new biological uh, uh, direction, uh, it's a concern. And uh, and there were legitimate, uh, le legitimate concerns that, you know, that if you, for example, would clone a you know an RNA tumor virus that maybe the bacteria would get out and cause cancer. Those are the kinds of things. But as the debate continued, and uh, more is learned uh, biologically, uh, and it was possible to develop uh, uh, vectors that were in you know disabled. Uh, it became uh, it came to the point uh, that. Uh, it was it was really not a controversy anymore that un under these new guidelines, the recombinant DNA guidelines, uh, it was safe. And then, of course, uh, it uh, the the field really took off. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, another question. Uh, recently, um, FDA vaccine advisors were disappointed and angry that um, early data about the new COVID nineteen booster shot wasn't presented for um, um a review last year. Do you think companies and governments should be more transparent about vaccines and drugs? And should there be greater liability if they were found to be negligent or deceptive? Yes, absolutely. I mean, and, and in fact, it does so uh, in, in many different areas, uh, both in uh, FDA approving drugs, uh, which uh, is obviously uh, uh, the final stage in the development uh, of a drug, uh, and and all of the laboratory uh, methods that are used, uh, uh, they're they're judged. For, uh, they're protocols that are developed and required. Uh, so uh, specifically in recombinant DNA, you know, this is now almost fifty years later. Uh, there is you know both a national office and a local program. Uh, for training and adherence to the guidelines. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, I, I think that was done really well and uh, and it will continue to be. And, and I think that uh, a lot of the issues about uh, COVID uh, really became more political than, uh, <laughs> uh, than biological. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, the government has done a good job in, in regulating uh, the, the safe use of, of these biological methods. Mm -hmm. So you also generated the first human genomic DNA library containing all of the genes in the human genome. So, you know, humans have a lot of genes. I mean, you mentioned there's so 8 billion units or something. So how are you um, um, able to do this? Well, you know, it's, it, it's remarkable that the tools have just continued to develop at an incredible pace from the time they were uh, first used. And so, you know, it really is possible now to routinely isolate any gene in the genome, uh, to piece it together into so-called vectors so that can be propagated either in bacteria or in mammalian cells, uh, and then studied in great detail, you know, understanding, identifying all the DNA sequences that are required to turn genes on and off at the right time or the right place. Uh, they're just uh, extraordinary tools, and that's that's why the field has moved uh, so rapidly. Yo, what is up, everyone? It's Diamond Go. Make sure you guys check out Newsly, an on one audio super app for iOS and Android. It picks up the most trending articles on the web on topics you choose at any given moment and reads them to you in a natural human voice. For the first time ever, the entire web becomes listenable all in one place. Browse articles from topics you choose and start playing. Stop scrolling, start listening. You can follow any topic as specific as you like, from sports, tech, business, science, Dogecoin, even Elon Musk. It will find you the latest articles and read them to you aloud. And they have podcasts as well. Explore trending podcasts from over 80 countries. My, pod my podcast is there too. I start using it as my default podcasting app. They even have, have digital radio. Download and use Newsly for free now from www.newsly.me or from the link in the description and use promo code early morning. All capital letters linked in the description receive a one month free premium subscription.
And you also made the molecular cloning manual. So why do you decide to make a manual? Well, what's happening is that, you know, we developed all these methods early on. This was uh, between 1976 and 1978, both cDNA cloning and genomic DNA libraries. And uh, I was asked to teach a, uh, a course at Cold Spring Harbor uh, on this technology. And that was really you know, only you know, two years after we developed it. And uh, so we had about 30 students and it was a, a summer course in which we brought all the reagents, the tools necessary to do cDNA uh, and genomic DNA cloning. And then uh, when, uh, when the course finished, uh, uh, James Watson, who then was uh, head of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, asked me if I would uh, uh, be willing to write a, uh, a cloning manual that had all the methodology in it. And uh, I agreed, and uh, along with Joe Sambrook, who was at Cold Spring Harbor uh, as the scientific director at the time, and uh, and Ed Fritch, who was then uh, a postdoc in my lab, uh, we d- we decided to do that, and you know it was uh, an extraordinarily uh, difficult uh, uh, undertaking, uh, but we we uh, we produced the first volume. I think it was 1982. And I think we went away, we went about it in a way in which it was uh, really impactful, that it had so many details there that it was possible for almost anyone to use this manual and to be in the field. And even today, when I run in, uh, into people at uh, conferences, they come up to me and say, you know, I'm uh, from China, from India, from South America. Uh, uh, I had no access to the technology, but because of the manual, uh, I was able to uh, be able to practice, uh, you know, uh, recombinant DNA research. And so, you know, I think it really democratized the technology in a way that uh, uh, would have been difficult in any other way. Yeah, so I mean, you mentioned Dr. James Watson. So to the listeners who don't know who he is, he's one of the discoverers of the DNA double helix structure. So what was Dr. Watson's personality like? And are you still in contact with him? Well, you know, I uh, my first faculty appointment was at Harvard, and of course he was there at the time. And he was an extraordinary man, intellectually, and uh, and uh, and he had a vision that few people had. Uh, and uh, he was known for being outspoken, uh, stubborn, uh, and as he got older, uh, that. Uh, uh, he, he expressed uh, certain views about race that were really unacceptable and quite shocking, uh, considering his intellect and you know uh, biological understanding that uh, uh, most of his friends really cannot understand uh, uh, how this happened. But as you know, uh, it uh, about ten years ago, probably he he made some racist comments about intelligence and race. And uh, remarkably, he had opportunities to uh, to address that uh, and to clarify, but he stayed by this. And uh, he was then uh, uh, lost his position at Cold Spring Harbor Lab and and so on. So it uh, it was uh, uh, it was obviously very bad. Uh, and uh, he he. Uh, He's now in his 90s, and I think 95, and he's isolated and, you know, uh, I think very unhappy. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's move on to your current research work. So your lab discovered the remarkable genomic um, um, organization of the, and correct me if I say where it's the protocat here in the PCDH gene cluster. So can you explain what the PCDH is? Yeah, so uh, this... These genes called proto-coherent genes uh, uh, are remarkable. They encode a cell surface barcode that allows individual neurons to uh, distinguish between each other. And that property is absolutely essential for normal wiring of the brain during development. And, uh, And what's remarkable about this cluster, there are 60 genes 
and they're very detailed mechanisms that make it possible to generate uh, in, uh, virtually unlimited uh, diversity at the cell surface. And so, for example, uh, a neuron, uh, as you know, has neurites, it has uh, various connections. And those neurites, if they couldn't tell each other uh, apart or from uh, neurites of other neurons, it would it would be a mess. And uh, what this <clears throat> what the these genes do is to make it possible for uh, every neuron to uh, uh, to be able to distinguish itself from every other neuron, and that turns out to be. Uh, fundamentally important in uh, the development of the brain. Uh, we've been able to uh, uh, make mutations in mice uh, in this in these genes, and they uh, they have both uh, uh, behavioral and uh, uh, circuitry uh, malfunctions. And what makes it so interesting is that the mechanism by which this code is generated is extremely complicated. But we now know a great deal about it. And you probably know about uh, diversity generated by uh, immunoglobulin, you know, in the immunoglobulin gene locus for making antibodies uh, and in the uh, T cell receptor locus for making, uh, you know, the receptors on T cells. And in those cases, the diversity is generated by a DNA driven mechanism. But in proto-coherence, it's done uh, in uh, at the level of gene regulation. And uh, we, we've, over the last 20 years, have learned a great deal about how that works. And we've also seen that uh, these genes uh, likely pay a very, play a very important role in diseases such as autism and schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. So what does the structure of a PCDH look like? Uh, well, it's... Uh, you know, it has a extracellular domain, which has five uh, five domains, uh, a transmembrane domain, and an intracellular domain. And uh, the uh, extracellular domain uh, engages in uh, something called homophilic interactions, and so like binds to like, uh, and so that uh, they make dimers. They're expressed at the cell surface, and they generate a lattice that is a recognition lattice. And if there's a perfect fit, the cells repulse, the, the, the neurons repulse each other or the cells. So uh, we, we, we know a great deal now uh, about, uh, about how all that works. Mm -hmm. So, you know, your lab is doing research on a myotrophic lateral sclerosis or it's called ALS. Uh, interestingly, Dr. Stephen Hawking was also an ALS patient. So what is ALS? Why do you get interested in studying it? You know, I, I should say that uh, I became interested uh, in ALS research because my sister, uh, when she was 50, uh, was diagnosed with a disease. And uh, uh, the average uh, uh, time a person lives after being diagnosed is about three years. And that's exactly uh, what happened to her. And so, uh, you know, I, I got very interested in trying to understand the disease and contribute in some way. And so I, I chaired a, um, a committee in the uh, National ALS Association to try to bring uh, basic scientists into the field. At the time that this happened, it was mostly doctors, medical people who were doing it. And it was more from a sort of clinical view instead of a mechanistic view. Unfortunately, that's grown now. And that uh, ALS, which was really, you know, uh, way behind other uh, fields of neurodegeneration, uh, is really now uh, in the lead. Uh, I'd say we know more about uh, ALS uh, mechanisms than, uh, than almost any other disease. Uh, but unfortunately, there still is not uh, a treatment or a drug available that really works. Yeah, man, it's really interesting because, you know, Dr. Stephen Hawking, you know, he got, I think he was also another patient with um, ALS and he lived for so long. So and it really depends on this type of person, I guess. Yeah, well, it's it's really, it's it's really interesting. This is extremely rare, obviously. And um, I had a, a good friend or have a good friend uh, who was diagnosed when he was in the second year of Harvard Business School. And that's back when I was at Harvard. And because I was working on ALS, 
uh, he approached me and uh, I worked with him to try to raise funds for research. And his disease moved extremely rapidly. And by uh, the third year, he was completely paralyzed, uh, couldn't breathe. And it looked like it was the end. And he's had a Hawking's-like uh, experience as well. He's he's still alive. Uh, uh, I think it's been you know about over twenty years ago. Uh, so these are very rare cases in in which this happened. We don't really have any understanding uh, about the difference in the disease progression. Yeah. So no, was the switch from molecular biology to like neuroscience really hard for you? Uh, yes, it, it, it's hard, but, you know, the, the, and again, this is all about recombinant DNA is that the basic tools for studying these diseases are those tools, you know, and so uh, we were able to do things uh, in both ALS and in, in the protocadherin genes uh, that, you know, were unthought, unthought of before, that you just couldn't do it without the technology. And so, uh, you know, there are different fields, but there's fundamental principles of biology that apply. And so, uh, and I, th I think that's the exciting thing about the field now is it's it's moving so rapidly because there's an amazing synergy of ideas and technology that make it possible to apply to many different diseases. And of course, sequencing the human genome has completely uh, revolutionized how science is working right now, uh, medical science. So how are you seeing um, embryonic stem cells and human-induced pluripotent stem cells in your ALS research? Yeah, we, you know, we, I think we had one of the earliest papers of uh, making so-called iPS cells from, uh, from a patient, uh, uh, turning those into motor neurons, and then cold culturing, you know, with astrocytes and other brain cells to try to understand uh, uh, that interaction. And uh, great progress has been made. You know, when, when I started, there was really only one gene that was identified that, uh, uh, that causes ALS when it's mutant. Now there are over 35 genes that have been identified for uh, for uh, both uh, sporadic and and familial ALS. So uh, you know it's and again it's it really was the recombinant DNA tools that made it possible to to learn all this. And so we can sequence genes from patients uh, and uh, you know in each of these areas, like uh, the uh, the first gene that was isolated was called SOD1. Uh, you know, there, there are about over 60 mutations that can cause ALS in that gene, and they've all been sequenced and identified. And so it's, uh, it, the, the field has really moved uh, rapidly uh, since the, you know, in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So for the mouse models you did, you started introducing conditional deletion mutations of autography genes such as APG7 and TPK1 into your mouse models. So right. So, you know, so the idea is that, is to uh, is to try to uh, uh, buy uh, you know I, I said say all the time that the recombinant DNA methods were being developed, uh, the ability to uh, alter the mouse genome uh, was happening at the same time, and it, you know it's really extraordinary technology to be able to both introduce mutations, introduce genes, uh, and so on. And that technology was really helpful. So there are mouse models in ALS with these different genes, uh, and uh, and in in a few cases, those mice really display uh, a neurodegenerative disease that is indistinguishable from human, and so it's provided the opportunity to really uh, study mechanisms. And basically, you know, it's a, a, an underlying. Uh, fact about ALS that's in common and actually in common with uh, Alzheimer's as well is that one of the fundamental causes of these diseases are the uh, aggregation, the aberrant abrogation, uh, aggregation of proteins. Uh, they form uh, big clusters that triggers all sorts of intracellular events leading to massive inflammation in the brain. And so uh, there must be, you know, 30 uh, uh, biotechnology companies now that are trying various ways of 
affecting protein aggregation and other uh, steps in the pathway. Mm -hmm. So no, you talked about your SOD1 gene. So you found that the loss of the autophagy function exclusively in the motor neurons of the SOD1 loss accelerated disease progression from early in the disease and diminished progression later. So yeah. you know, as, an, as an um entrepreneur, have you thought about commercializing, like inhibiting the gene? That's exactly what we're trying to do. So the idea would be that uh, early in disease, uh, uh, for example, in, in the TBK1 case, uh, uh, you, you need TBK1 because it's involved in protein degradation in, in a process called autophagy. Uh, but late, uh, TBK1 uh, plays a key role in inflammation. And so the idea is to try to, uh, for example, in, in the TBK1 case, is to inhibit TBK1 late and hopefully extend life. Because we, got, we, we saw a very significant extension of life of mice uh, by uh, inhibiting uh, the kinase late. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're also the co-founder of multiple biotech companies like Genetics Institute, Inc., um, Acceleron Pharma, Proscript, and Calio. So what's your favorite aspect of being an entrepreneur? Well, it's obviously really exciting. And I should say that when, when I started off in science, the, the last thing I could ever imagine that I'd be involved in that sort of thing. Uh, you know, back when I was a undergraduate or early graduate school, uh, you know, as chemists that were involved in, uh, in medical uh, applications, uh, there's very little biology. And, uh, you know, again, with recombinant DNA, uh, that has changed uh, really dramatically. And so, you know, the first company, Genetics Institute, uh, was all about cloning important proteins that uh, are deficient producing them large amounts in mammalian cells, and that's the drug. So they're called, you know, the, the whole new field developed of protein biologics. Uh, erythropoietin was used uh, to stimulate red blood cell uh, growth and so on. And so, uh, you know, that was an era that uh, lasted, you know, maybe 20 years. There's still, you know, some activity in that, but, uh, you know, the work now is really... Uh, sort of circle back to small molecules based on the biology that you learn by cloning genes. Hmm. So, you know, the, the, uh, the second uh, company uh, I started uh, was uh, developed the drug Velcade, you know, which is a proteasome inhibitor. And that came uh, out of studies in my lab in which we found that a transcription factor called NF-kappa B uh, requires the ubiquitin proteasome pathway in order to be active. So by inhibiting it, we inhibit, we inhibit the pathway that NF-kappa B is involved in. And there are other examples like that. Yeah, man, I think personally the biotech industry has just changed so much. Like I remember when I was a kid, you know, it's all about technology, Google, Apple. Now it's like, you know, you get all the biotech companies like in the conversation kind of. No, I mean... Now, you know, uh, with the CRISPR technology and all sorts of other new technologies, it's extremely expansive. And, you know, when I was uh, uh, when I was on the faculty at Harvard, uh, you know, Kendall Square was a pretty scary place. You know, it was uh, run down, you know, their old factories that had closed there and so on. And now, you know, it is the center of the world, you know, in biotechnology, the, the, the amount of expansion, including big pharma that move there. Uh, it's it's uh, extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, you know, Merck announced that it would acquire um, Celeron for $11.5 I think it was a year ago. Do you think a Celeron will continue to have a bright future under Merck? Oh, yeah. No, I think, you know, the latest drug that, and the reason why uh, Merck bought it uh, was in, uh, uh, in fibrosis. Uh, this drug really works. And uh, in something called uh, uh, pulmonary atrial uh, hypertrophy, which is a fibrotic disease, a genetic disease of the lung. And it's really working in the clinic. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, that, that is, uh, you know, the, the earlier drugs uh, were used uh, for um, 
MDS uh, and uh, and beta thalassemia, and I think uh, the Merck drug, uh, if it it's pretty far along in the clinic now, it will be uh, even more successful than the earlier drugs. Yeah, so just looking at the different companies you founded, you know, how are you able to come up with the names for them that's like ProScript and Calliop seem kind of creative and weird? <laughs> well, uh, it really, it's all about having an exciting mechanistic insight into a possible uh, drug pathway and treatment, uh, understanding the biology well enough and having an idea of how to approach it. And uh, Calliope is uh, is a perfect example of that. You know, this is uh, Charles Zucker, uh, my colleague at Columbia, is uh, you know, one of the uh, leading biologists in taste perception, and uh, and he got interested in the gut brain axis uh, and all of the molecular uh, insights into what's going on there. And so uh, we started that at a moment when uh, single cell sequencing was just starting. And so we were able to move quickly and put together an extraordinary team of uh, recent postdocs and, uh, and other people uh, to, uh, to really generate a cell atlas of the gut-brain axis and to really use that to identify potential ligands and targets. And, you know, it's all about good science. It really is. It's the, the, the companies that succeed are the ones that really have both the technologies and the knowledge of the biology that make it possible to uh, identify drug pathways that can be approached. Mm, so I have two questions for you. So what are the biggest challenges to being an um, entrepreneur and how do you stay on top of biotech industry trends? Uh, I would say the most important thing uh, to be successful in biotechnology is one, to have scientific colleagues that are extraordinary and uh, committed and trustworthy. And the second is to have uh, really sophisticated, dedicated venture capital, uh, because companies are always going to go through ups and downs. And if uh, the venture people are essentially making an investment for a uh, for a um, a quick turnaround, uh, you won't be successful. It's just impossible. They have to be in it for the long run because it takes time to do this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Genetics Institute uh, was around for, you know, 15 years bef before it became really profitable. And they produced, I think, on the order of eight FDA approved drugs, you know, but it took it took a very long time to both learn the science and improve the technology to uh, develop these drugs and to get them through the FDA. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it's, you know, I'd say those two things having and, and of course, fundamentally important is uh, your ability to identify talent and to recruit them, because mm -hmm. that's in the end uh, what makes it happen. If you don't have extraordinary people working on the inside of the company, fully dedicated, uh, it's not going to work. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting for the venture capitalists. You know, I think I was talking with Dr. Langer about, you know, how venture capitalists are moving to biotech. And it's as many of them are, like, trying to, like, adopt from, like, the high-tech thing of, like, quick turnaround, finish, you know, a device in one year to, like, all right, you're going to work on this drug for 10 years, 10 to 20 years kind of thing. Yeah, well, I mean, and every obviously every drug is different, and there's some – there, there have been, uh, and certainly more frequently recently, high, you know, short turnaround uh, where you have a drug in two years, you know, but uh, but I think that uh, that's happening more frequently because the the field has matured, and there are a lot of low hanging fruit right now uh, that uh, the technology is mature, and you can move quickly. And a lot of the delays in early biotech was just putting to uh, technical uh, wherewithal uh, together to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So you also co-founded New York Genome Center in 2010, and you're the current CEO of this. So why do you co-found the New York Genome Center? <laughs> uh, the answer to that is ALS. 
Ah, I see. Uh, so when I when I came to New York in 2010, uh, I was shocked to see that there was so little genomic technology accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, I, I, I left uh, just about the same time as the Broad emerged as a major power. And there wasn't anything like the Broad in New York City. And so uh, I, uh, I decided that uh, I was really sort of uh, from Columbia's perspective initially, that it was really necessary to put the resources together and no single institution could really do it, uh, both intellectually and uh, financially. And so uh, I went, uh, actually, uh, you'd be interested that the first person I went to uh, with this proposal of creating the Genome Center was, uh, uh, was Harold Varmus. And he oh, was yeah. just- like on he the was podcast, yeah. Dr. Varmus, yeah. Yeah, so he he was just leaving uh, the uh, uh, MSK uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering to uh, uh, to take the job of the head of the Cancer Institute at NIH, and uh, and he he decided it would be I mean he agreed it would be a great thing to do, and then I just systematically met with people, and I'd say one of the most important uh, was Mark Tessier Levine who uh, had just uh, moved from Genentech uh, to become the president of Rockefeller. And so uh, he and I uh, worked closely together to try to make this happen politically and financially. And fortunately, at a very key moment, uh, Jim Simons, uh, who is an extraordinary uh, philanthropist of science, uh, you know, his between Berkeley, MIT, Harvard, uh, Columbia, <laughs> Rockefeller, he's given enormous amounts of his wealth uh, to science. And of course, he's uh, established the Flatiron Institute, which is extraordinary. Yeah. So, so he, you know, it was, it was he and Russ Carson, uh, who's another philanthropist, uh, who is chairman of our board. And it's the combination of uh, their uh, wealth and uh, their leadership that really made it possible to get through the rough periods of establishing the Genome Center. And it's thriving now. We have 12 faculty who have joint appointments at all of the various institutions uh, uh, in uh, New York City, their tenure track. Uh, we have a, a computational biology group, high-level sequencing group, and it's all come together in, in, a, in a really great way. And, and I think that uh, these issues that we talked about at the beginning of this conversation of really identifying the functional consequences of DNA sequence uh, variation uh, is now ripe. Uh, all the pieces are in place, and we're very excited about being in the center of that. Mm -hmm. So what is the future of the biotech field? Uh, you know, I I think uh, considering that we've hardly touched the complexity of human diseases that are based on genetic variation, mm -hmm. uh, it's going to continue to advance, explode with, uh, you know, who would have guessed uh, about CRISPRs, you know, four years ago? Uh, and uh, and there'll be there'll be more CRISPRs and more, you know, more technological advances. Uh, including imaging, single cell uh, biology, and so on, that will really contribute to it. So it, I think uh, it's it's going to be uh, thriving uh, even more uh, in the next in the next decade. Mm -hmm. So, what advice did you receive during your career that shaped your professional development or success? Uh, I would say the number one thing you have to do is to be a successful scientist and have a productive laboratory that is contributing both the technology and the biology uh, and to uh, have the energy and commitment uh, to uh, take the tools you're using in basic research and apply them in biotech. And, uh, and you know, there's so many examples of that now that uh, you'll see that uh, some of the most uh, accomplished uh, uh, and active scientists uh, are the ones that are really driving the biotech energy mm -hmm. industry. So what additional advice would you give to students who want to pursue biology or biotech? 
Uh, you know, it's really similar to what I just said about succeeding uh, in biotech, that uh, it's really important to uh, excel in every way, uh, to be able to uh, to go to the best institutions that are doing the most exciting research, uh, to uh, to accomplish things that put you in a position in which you your work and your ideas are respected. Because ultimately, when a biotech company starts or when somebody approaches you, it's based on uh, their respect uh, for your accomplishments. And so uh, you can't really do anything if you don't build a structure first. Mm -hmm. So is there um, anything else that we didn't touch upon that you know, we should tell our audience? Um, yeah, you know, I think it, it was it's interesting and it takes us back to where we started this conversation is that you know there was this period of uh, recombinant DNA in which uh, it was became extremely controversial, and we made it through that. We came up with the rules, and it obviously is thriving. Uh, a similar thing happened with CRISPR. We're not there yet. That uh, there, are, it, it's obviously far more dangerous, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, technology than, uh, than uh, cloning genes. Uh, but that uh, I, th I think that this will continue to happen. And uh, those who are successful are the ones that recognize the significance and importance the earliest on and use that information uh, to uh, to establish biotech companies. I mean, uh, you know, and, and that means you have to have your sleeves rolled up and working on it in your own lab in order to, for you to have uh, credibility. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Dr. Um, Maniatis, for being part of this episode and giving me the opportunity to, to ask you questions so people can get to know more about your insights into ALS, recombinant DNA, and also business. Well, it was a pleasure to meet you. And uh, I have to say, uh, what you've accomplished is quite amazing. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, uh, you really uh, you are showing all of the right entrepreneurial uh, skills in uh, in establishing a successful uh, program. So I congratulate you. Right.